Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 7 lecture which is all about microbial metabolism really. So metabolism is a fancy word for all of the chemical reactions that go on in a cell. These include the breakdown reactions and also the build up reactions. So metabolism can be broken up into two chunks, I guess. Uh, these breakdown reactions, which are called catabolism, and the build up reactions, which is called anabolism. So an anabolic reactions take basic um, building blocks like monomers, amino acids, monosaccharides, and link them together to build larger molecules, polymers. And it requires energy to do this, to build things. But we need to get that energy from somewhere, and we get that energy from doing the reverse reaction, from basically taking polymers and breaking them down into monomers. That releases energy, chemical energy, and it also releases a bunch of building blocks that we can use to do anabolism. So it's really a, a cycle here um, of reactions. <clears throat> so all chemical reactions in cells are um, catalyzed or sped up by proteins called enzymes. And enzymes are biological catalysts. Catalyst is anything that speeds up a chemical reaction. And some terminology surrounding enzymes to know is that um, so enzymes speed up chemical reactions by binding to chemical reactants, bringing them together, and facilitating the bonds breaking and reforming that leads to products. And so those substances that an enzyme binds to are called the substrates. So a substrate is a term that, actually, that has multiple meanings in different contexts, but in biology, Substrate is a thing that binds to an enzyme. So different enzymes have different substrates. They're specific for certain substrates. And the spot on the enzyme where the substrates bind is called the active site. And that's because it's where the activity of catalysis occurs. So the active site is the part on the enzyme where the substrates bind. And when substrates bind to the enzyme, we collectively refer to that as the enzyme substrate complex, or for short, the ES complex. And then <clears throat> um, products form, in this case it looks like this, this pink and orange molecule got cleaved, cut in half, and now there's two products, okay? So a lot of times this, the way that, that enzymes recognize their substrates is that substrates basically just fit really perfectly into the active site. Um, we, it's called the lock and key model. You know, lots of keys look the same, but only one key, only the right key will actually open the lock. Um, so similarly, enzymes may look similar or bind similar things, but a lot of times they're very substrate specific. And this is important or relevant because when we talk about things like designing you know, antibiotics, all right? We wanna design things that inhibit bacterial enzymes that oftentimes a lot of drugs act as inhibitors that mimic natural substrates and sort of uh, fit in that block. So when it comes to enzymes, um, they oftentimes require a sort of sidekick in order to help them function or bind to substrate. So most enzymes also require a cofactor or a coenzyme. So a co-chair, co-leader, a co-boss. Um, so the difference between a cofactor and a coenzyme is chemical. So cofactors are minerals, usually ions like iron or nickel or zinc can be cofactors, whereas coenzymes are small organic molecules, and we tend to call those our vitamins. So coenzymes are vitamins, cofactors are minerals, and that's why we have to eat those things, consume those things, all organisms. When I say we, I guess I mean um, the collective we of all organisms. We need minerals and vitamins in our diets because we need them to serve as coenzymes and cofactors to our various cellular enzymes. <clears throat> 
So enzymes that require a cofactor or a coenzyme that they have to bind together, we call those conjugated enzymes. So in these examples of these conjugated enzymes here, right, they will not function without their cofactor and or coenzyme. The, the whole thing, the enzyme is not complete and functional until it is bound to that that partner. So again, why minerals and vitamins are important because you may make the, your cells may make these enzymes, but the enzymes can't function without those minerals or coenzymes bound to them. So there's lots of different types of enzymes. We classify enzymes by their function, by the type of reactions they catalyze. Some major classes of enzymes, um, oxidoreductases, these are ones that are involved in redox reactions, which in chemistry is just the transfer of electrons or sometimes the transfer of hydrogens. Um, transferases transfer entire functional groups, so like chemical groups like methyl group or an alcohol group. They can just pop it off one molecule and put it on another molecule. Hydrolases, hydro means water, so these are, um, are enzymes that cleave water, that break up water bonds. Lyases are things that um, remove double bonds, so carbon-carbon double bonds from things. Isomerases basically just shuffle around the atoms in a molecule so that their chemical formula doesn't change, but they switch sort of position or shape. And ligases are enzymes that fuse things together. To ligate is to connect. So there's also so those are just sort of broad classes of enzymes. There's lots of enzymes that serve as ligases, for example. There's also, we'll talk about enzymes throughout metabolism that have specific functions, specific names. So you will learn some specific enzymes in the next couple of chapters. And generally, enzymes are named after usually their substrate, whatever it is they actually cut or work on. Um, so for example, amylase, digests amylose and amylopectin, which are starches, DNA cuts DNA, etc. So enzymes are necessary. We can't function, our cells can't um, do chemistry fast enough to support life without enzymes. Um, so there's all kinds of enzymes that our cells will make we don't always need all those enzymes all the time though. I like to kind of equate this to like the lights in your house, right? So you need lights in every room so you can see when it's dark, but if the windows open and the lights are on, you don't need, or if the, the windows open and it's daytime, you don't need the lights on. If you're not home, you don't need the lights on. And if you do leave the lights on, you're wasting energy. And so the same thing with cells. They don't need their enzymes on all the time. And if they do keep their enzymes on all the time, then they're just wasting energy. And so there's a couple of different ways that enzymes are regulated to prevent energy waste. So there are some enzymes that are just needed kind of all of the time. Um, and those are what we call constitutive enzymes. And so those are around all the time in kind of like, you know, um, constant numbers. So constitutive kind of sounds like constant. So that's how I remember that one. Constitutive are constant. So um, whether or not there's a little bit of substrate around or a lot of substrate around, you still you have these enzymes and they're in pretty constant numbers versus regulated enzymes. So these are enzymes that maybe our cells don't need all the time, only under certain conditions. And so if there's not a lot of substrate around, we don't have a lot of that enzyme. But then if more substrate is added, the cells upregulate and they turn on production of those enzymes and make more of them. And so the in regulated enzymes, the amount of enzyme um, fluctuates and correlates really with the amount of substrate that's present. Um, so of course, enzymes are proteins. They're made, they're made of folded proteins. And so they are very sensitive to things in the environment that proteins are sensitive to things like temperature, pH, all of those things can result in, um, unfolding or denaturation of a protein. So this process here, 
is not it's not digestion of a protein you're not cutting the peptide bonds between the amino acids you're simply unfolding it and we call that denaturing and um, it's easier to denature a protein than to digest it it's little things like temperature and and pH can do that um, but when that happens the protein is not functional and if that protein is an enzyme the enzyme is not functional so enzymes are specific or they are um, influenced or affected by different environmental conditions that we will get to um, so one of the ways that cells control the amount of enzyme whether it's constitutive or regular or really for regulation for enzymes that are regulated um, they're usually regulated at the genetic level at the DNA level so genes encode proteins and so genes can be basically turned on or turned off kind of like you know printers print documents and you could print 30 copies of a document or one copy of a document or not print any at all so it's kind of like your you know your dna is like the computer that tells the printer what to do um, and so similarly your dna has the instructions and it tells the ribosomes ultimately what to do what to make so if your body if your if a cell has plenty of an enzyme and doesn't need any more then it'll turn off the expression of that gene and it won't send it to the printer essentially whereas if you do need more of an enzyme then you send copies to the printer so we call this enzyme repression and enzyme induction so in repression, a classic example of, of how microbes do this in a really efficient way is they have these genetic regions called operons. And so a really beautiful example of, an, of gene expression of regulation is the lac operon. So this noodle here, this colored noodle, is representing DNA, a stretch of DNA in a bacteria, and these different uh, colored sections represent you know, different different types of sequences um, so essentially this is a region of DNA that codes for enzymes where are they well they're not it'll be on the next slide codes for enzymes that digest lactose okay and so when lactose is not around you get this repressor this green thing here binds to the DNA and then the polymerase can't come in it can't read it it can't send it to the printer it can't do transcription and translation okay but if you add lactose which is a sugar it'll bind to that repressor and it'll remove it from the DNA so now this DNA section is open and polymerase is free to read it and start making mRNAs and basically sending it to the printer start expressing that enzyme or that series of actually a series of enzymes that are important for breaking down lactose so this is called induction enzyme induction is when we turn on production repression is when we turn off production and um, so th this is sort of an introduction here to next chapter which we're going to talk all about this central dogma of biology how proteins are made in the cell so the dna encodes the genes encodes the instructions for the proteins those instructions a copy of those instructions are sent out to the ribosome and that copy of the instructions is called the messenger rna all right and uh, it's the ribosome that reads the messenger RNA and turns it into protein right then the protein can fold and become an enzyme the enzyme can then act on its substrate catalyze the reaction form products and then once the cell has built up enough of that product and doesn't need any more all right the product can actually go and bind to the DNA and stop the production of that enzyme so if you have enough enzyme you don't need to be making more you want to shut down this energy wasting process and so this is called a negative feedback loop when the output of you know, a pathway actually feeds back and inhibits the pathway um, 
So that's a common, negative feedback is a common way that enzymes are regulated, where the, their products of the reaction that they catalyze ends up actually binding to the DNA and stopping any more enzyme from being made. So enzymes can also be regulated. They can be turned off. So their production can be turned off. That's genetic regulation. Or their function can essentially be turned off by inhibiting them. And there's sort of two broad classes of inhibitors. You can have competitive inhibitors or non-competitive inhibitors. So competitive inhibitors are ones that mimic the substrate. They look a lot like the substrate and they compete for the active site. So in order to bind to the active site, they have to look a lot like the substrate because the active site is, is a very perfect fit for the substrate. Um, and what happens is when a competitive inhibitor binds, it blocks the active site so the normal substrate can't bind and that normal reaction can't be catalyzed. Now, the thing with competitive inhibitors is they can be outcompeted. It's a competition. So essentially, whichever one there's more of will win out. So if you have, um, if you're trying to inhibit an enzyme, you want to add a lot of inhibitor. If you're trying to uninhibit, an enzyme, you can do that by just adding more substrate in chemistry. A non-competitive inhibitor, though, is one that binds to a different site on the enzyme, not the active site. And in doing so, it causes the enzyme to shapeshift a little bit, to morph, and no longer fit the substrate. So it changes the shape of the active site so that it can't bind substrate anymore. And like the name suggests, it is non-competitive. So there's no way to get rid of that inhibitor with adding more substrate. It doesn't matter how much substrate you add, you're not gonna be able to bump out that inhibitor. So this is a great summary slide from the textbook that talks about different enzyme characteristics. They're made of protein, they require cofactors, they speed up chemical reactions. Um, so this is a, a good, good chart to refer to when you're studying for about enzymes. These are all things I expect you to know about enzymes um, and be able to apply. So like for example, um, you know, if I said what part, what biomolecule in the cell is greatly affected by temperature and pH, it would be protein. Enzymes are made of protein. Enzymes are what are affected by temperature and pH or, um, to do, do, do a key a key feature of catalysts is that they are not permanently changed by the reaction they're not they an enzyme might bind to a substrate and change its shape temporarily but it doesn't get used up it's it can be used many many times um, all right so now we're going to look so we've talked about en uh, enzymes which are sort of the workhorses of metabolism. So now let's get into metabolism and the use, the creation and then use of energy in the cells. So when we talk about cellular energy, we're referring to a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So it's not so much that cells create energy, they create ATP and they do that by capturing energy from one reaction and using it in another reaction, or releasing energy in one reaction, and then using it to fuel another reaction. Um, and ATP happens to be a molecule that stores energy very well. So um, in chemistry, when you have a reaction that releases energy, we say that it is exergonic or sometimes exothermic, and that energy is released, and these are always going to be breakdown reactions. So catabolic reactions are exergonic. They release energy that we capture and use to make a molecule of ATP from ADP and phosphate. And then we can break apart that ATP to release the energy in order to do endergonic reactions, ones that, that um, require energy and those are our anabolic reactions here in order to build larger molecules we need to input energy so um, in cells what we will see is that often 
Endergonic and exergonic reactions are coupled. They're basically done right next to each other so that the energy from one reaction can be captured or used to fuel the energy of another reaction. So in metabolism, these reactions, it's not just like one reaction. It's not like, oh, you take glucose and you turn it to ATP in one step. All right, there's multiple steps that you have to take. If you think of production of anything, really. My daughter likes to watch, used to look watching this show called How Things Are Made, which is actually an old show that I used to watch when I was a kid. And it, you know, goes through the process. There's one like about making candy canes. So it goes through the whole process of like, you know, boiling the sugar and then how they like dye it and then fold it together and then roll it through all these machines. So there's all these steps. There's multiple steps to making things. So same thing on a molecular level. There's multiple steps. There's multiple chemical reactions, one by one changes, that a molecule undergoes in order to become an ultimate product. So um, we call these metabolic pathways. A pathway is just a series of steps that happens in succession in order to go from, you know, molecule A to molecule G. Um, and so each step in the reaction will be catalyzed by a different enzyme. And in catabolism, we're going to talk about several metabolic pathways. There are so many metabolic pathways in the cell. This is a common poster that you find in labs, um, especially labs that study metabolism, except that all of these dots and stuff are, are labeled. It looks like a subway map of some kind with all these little, the nodes representing stations and then the lines representing you know, tracks. Okay, but this is a map of different metabolic pathways, different chemical reactions that occur in the cell that lead to the formation of different products. And you'll see there's a lot of overlap. Um, when I talk about ATP, I talk about it as an energy molecule, but ATP is also a nucleotide. It's an RNA nucleotide, it's a building block of RNA. Essentially, we modify it a little bit. So a lot of molecules can kind of moonlight a little bit, have multiple functions, or be able to participate in multiple pathways. But there's also um, some, uh, what do I want to say? Like, you know, there's, there's still definite, these definite pathways. It's not just like a random maze. There are definite pathways that molecules follow, hence the color coding. So this is just a, a web of metabolism, and metabolism is very complicated for those who study it, um, as it is demonstrated sort of by this map here. So an important type of chemical reaction that occurs in metabolism are what we collectively refer to as redox reactions. So redox is short for reduction and oxidation. And these are chemical reactions that involve the transfer of electrons, or sometimes the transfer of hydrogens. And uh, the mnemonic to remember which is which, oxidation is loss of electrons, and reduction is gain of electrons. So oil rig is a common mnemonic. Oil oxidation is loss, rig reduction is gain. There's another one, Leo says Gurr. Leo L Leo the lion says Gur. So Leo is loss of electrons is oxidation. Um, Gur gain of electrons is reduction. So either way. Um, and so what we mean by that is, um, and the, the reason we call them redox reactions, and we sort of we blend those two words together, is because they happen in conjunction. So one atom or molecule will lose electrons and immediately another atom picks them up. So it's not like electrons just get like spit out into the milieu. They get picked up by something. And in metabolism, we use molecules that we, are, we call electron carriers, molecules whose job it is to pick up electrons and then carry them away to other redox reactions in the cell. Um, so the two main electron carriers that we'll talk about in metabolism are NAD and FAD. And you can imagine them or picture them as almost like little molecular shuttle buses or pickup trucks. 
that they come in empty. So NAD is empty, doesn't have, it's the um, oxidized form, all right? It has lost electrons and it comes in and it gets reduced when this molecule here gets um, oxidized. So this A, let's call this compound A, all right, it has two electrons and it gets oxidized, it loses those electrons. At the same time, NAD is getting reduced. It's picking up those electrons and now it's gonna carry them to a place known as the electron transport chain that we'll get into in more detail, but essentially in the electron transport chain, that is where ATP is made. We use those electrons to basically generate electricity that helps us to make ATP. So electron carriers are really important in metabolic pathways because so many of the reactions are redox reactions. And electron carriers capture those electrons and ultimately carry them to the electron chain to for us. So ATP is often described as the currency of energy of the cells. And what it is, is it's made up of three parts. So A is for adenine, and that's a nitrogenous base that's pictured here in pink. Triphosphate, those, that means three phosphate groups, and those can be seen here. And then it also contains a sugar. So um, the ribose plus the adenine plus one phosphate is called AMP. And AMP is a nucleotide of RNA. It's the A base of RNA. Um, but you add a couple more phosphates to it and suddenly it doesn't have anything to do with DNA. With RNA, it is an energy molecule. So these phosphate bonds happen to store a lot of energy. And when we break the phosphate bond, particularly that third one, it releases a lot of energy. When we react ATP with water, that breaking of that bond is very endergonic, or sorry, it's very exergonic. It releases a lot of energy, and that energy can be used to fuel an endergonic reaction. So that's how and why ATP is this energy molecule. It just can store, a, there's a lot of energy in that bond, and we, when we react it with water, we release that energy very easily. And then <clears throat> we actually recycle ATP so after we break that bond, it becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a single free phosphate. And through the process of um, catabolism, we actually reattach that phosphate and make more ATP. So that's just what this slide is kind of showing, just another slide showing you. Here's a cartoon molecule of ATP often pictured in textbooks as like this star, you know, it's an energy explosion. All right, when we react it with water, we detach that third phosphate and we end up with ADP and phosphate and then we can use energy from catabolism to repair it and to make more ATP. So this here shows that cycle a little bit better. Um, we use ATP to fuel functions in the cell, and then we use energy from our food to remake and replenish our ATP stores. So what can ATP be, cellular energy be used for? Well, it can be used for three different types of work, essentially. So it can do chemical work, it can power endergonic reactions, it can provide the energy for endergonic reactions to go. It can do mechanical work, think of muscle contraction, um, or in cells, like when we, you know, like amoeba moving their pseudopods or flagella needing to spin or flip back and forth, depending on if it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote, all right, that requires energy to do mechanical work. That's ATP that fuels that. And also it is sometimes needed for transport. We talked about passive and active transport through the membrane. If you're trying to transport something against its concentration gradient, that requires energy and that's in the form of ATP. So those are the three different ways that ATP fuels work around the cell <clears throat> or provides energy for processes around the cell. All right, so remember with um, metabolism, it is catabolism and anabolism. So it's the breakdown and the buildup pathways. So the things that we break down 
are our food molecules. And again, I'm talking about the collective we, as in all organisms. Right? All organisms get nutrients from their environment, and then they have to break down those nutrients, which are large, complex biomolecules, and they break them down into essentially their individual building blocks. And then they have this pool of building blocks that they can use to build their own cellular molecules that they need. And those would be anabolic pathways. So in this catabolic pathway, the breakdown process, we end up doing a lot of redox reactions, generating a lot of electron carriers, reduced electron carriers, that then go to the electron transport chain and make us ATP. And that ATP that we make is then gonna fuel the anabolic pathways. Anabolic pathways. So let's first talk more in detail about catabolism. <clears throat> so there's three main pathways of getting energy from glucose. So we can catabolize or break down fats, carbs, and proteins for energy. The one that cells rely on most are carbohydrates. So we take our, you know, starches and they get broken down into individual monosaccharides, mostly of glucose. And then that glucose goes through metabolic pathways to produce ATP. So it can either undergo aerobic respiration, which is a pathway that uses oxygen. It can go undergo anaerobic respiration, which doesn't use oxygen. Or there's this third pathway called fermentation, which is technically a form of anaerobic metabolism. It does not require oxygen, but it's very different than these two pathways. So I'm going to show you in picture form the visual here. So what is confusing a lot of times to students is that in microbiology, anaerobic respiration is different than anaerobic respiration in like anatomy physiology. So aerobic organisms, um, whether they're bacteria or human, all right, do aerobic respiration in their cells. They go through three processes, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. And where oxygen is needed is at the end of the electron transport chain. So at the end of the electron transport chain, these electrons flow through, and in order to flow, they need to have an ultimate destination. Their ultimate destination is oxygen. And so oxygen acts as this electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain, and that's where ATP is generated. All right, in um, microbes that are that can't use oxygen, that oxygen is toxic to them, all right, they actually have the same pathways for glucose. The difference is that at the end of that electron, their electron transport system, they use a different molecule, so not oxygen, but something else as their final electron acceptor. So aerobic and anaerobic respiration in microbes looks very similar. They're like nearly identical except for this final molecule, right? Fermentation, this is what in anatomy physiology classes, biology classes, we often learn is air, anaerobic respiration, which is not wrong. And it's, it's anaerobic, it's a form of anaerobic respiration that occurs in aerobic organisms. So it's sort of like the plan B when aerobic respiration is not an option. So if you are an organism that, so organisms generally produce their energy one of these two ways. But if, they, if they're aerobic and they usually rely on oxygen for energy and there's no oxygen around, they can often turn on this second pathway, this sort of like poor man's energy pathway, of fermentation and fermentation is is much simpler than both of these respiratory pathways it does still involve glycolysis but there's no Krebs cycle or, or um, electron transport chain just the products of glycolysis end up being used directly for energy it's not very efficient so if we look at the total amount of ATP that's made in each of these three pathways aerobic respiration is the most efficient it 
it generates consistently somewhere between 36 and 38 ATPs. Anaerobic respiration can be equally as efficient, but it can also be really inefficient. So it, it's quite variable. Um, fermentation is pretty inefficient, does not make a lot of energy, but it is sometimes necessary when you don't have oxygen around. So it's a quick way to get energy from glucose um, when the cell is starving from oxygen. So we're going to talk about each of these different pathways, but this is a great summary slide that shows you, for example, the important outputs of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, and then ultimately the electron transport chain. So if I could change one thing about this slide, I think I would make these the ATP coming out of glycolysis and Krebs cycle smaller because they only spit out, you know, a couple of ATPs. And then the one for the electron transport chain, I would like blow it up to be a lot larger because most of the ATP that's generated in a cell is generated from specifically the electron transport chain. That part of the pathway is what really makes the most ATP. <clears throat> so let's start with the first um, pathway in those three, three stages of metabolism or of catabolism, and the first one is glycolysis. So glycolysis is common to all three. So aerobic, anaerobic fermentation all involve glycolysis. And glycolysis is actually a 10-step pathway. Um, so what happens in that, in those 10 steps, and this is just a synopsis, this is not all 10 steps. We take a molecule of glucose, which is a six carbon compound, and we break it up into two three carbon molecules of pyruvate. So you start with one glucose, you end with two pyruvates or pyruvic acid. It can, you can call it either one. Also, as a byproduct, you will produce two ATPs, energy molecules, and you'll undergo redox reactions that end up making two NADHs or filling two electron carriers with electrons. The next stage or the next step is called the Krebs cycle. It's kind of annoying, but there's lots of different names for this cycle. So in biology books, it's usually referred to as the Krebs cycle. In chemistry books, it's called the citric acid cycle. And then it's like 50-50, sometimes bio biologists call it the TCA cycle, the um, tricarboxylic acid cycle. So for all intents and purposes, those are the same thing, Krebs cycle, TCA cycle, citric acid cycle. It's all three, just three different names for the same exact process, right? And in the, um, the Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle only takes, never mind, I'm not gonna say that. Okay, so the Krebs cycle takes pyruvate from glycolysis, um, converts it into acetyl-CoA, actually that's a separate step. So um, before the pyruvate goes into the Krebs cycle, it must be converted into acetyl-CoA. And so the Krebs cycle takes acetyl-CoA and it cycles it through. So the Krebs cycle is eight steps. So there's eight steps in the biochemical reactions that happen here. And it some of the important products of the Krebs cycle are carbon dioxide. The reason that we breathe out carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is a waste product specifically of the Krebs cycle. That's where we generate all of our carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide can acidify the blood, so we do actually have to get rid of it, all right? We do make a little bit of ATP. Two more ATPs come out of one turn of the Krebs cycle, but we also make a bunch more of these electron carriers. So we get six NADHs and two FADH2s for a single turn of the Krebs cycle. And for one molecule of glucose, we get two turns of the Krebs cycle because one molecule of glucose makes two pyruvates and each pyruvate goes through a Krebs cycle. Okay, so we actually um, get this. This is our yield from two cycles of the Krebs cycle. Um, 
Then the third stage of catabolism is the electron transport chain. Mm, I don't want my head here. I want it up here. Okay, so the electron transport chain is in all cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. This is a prokaryote. We're looking at a gram-positive bacteria. Here's our thick peptidoglycan layer. All right, and here's the cell membrane. So um, the electron transport chain in all cells is located in a membrane. It's a series of proteins. All right, and what happens, and they can, they trans, they transport electrons. That's why it's called the electron transport chain. The electrons sort of flow through them. And what is electron flow? It's electricity. That's what electricity is. It's flow of electrons. And electricity powers things, right? So that flow of electrons, what it's powering, is actually the pumping of hydrogen ions or protons. Hydrogen ion is just a proton, all right, up out of this um, in, out of the cell into this space right here and it concentrates them into this space and that highly concentrated group of hydrogen ions or protons they are all positively charged and they're repelling each other they do not like being crowded like that they want to move back into the cell but they can't do that through the membrane they can only do it through a channel and that channel is this last complex here called ATP synthase. So when the protons go back in through the channel, they actually kind of spin this rotor in ATP synthase here that um, helps to create energy. But the other thing that creates energy is the, um, the exergonic reaction, uh, redox reaction that happens at the end. So when those protons come back into the cell, they combine with oxygen in aerobic organisms to make water molecules. And this reaction here is very exergonic. It releases a lot of energy and that fuels the reaction of ADP binding to ATP to form ATP. Um, and we so that's an example of reaction coupling. And we call that step, we call that process oxidative phosphorylation um, because we're using oxygen the oxidation part is using the oxygen binding the hydrogen ions to form water all right and the phosphorylation reaction is adding a phosphate to ADP in order to get ATP um, so oxidative phosphorylation is what we call another term for ATP production, essentially. It's the actual chemical reaction that occurs when we create ATP at the end of the electron transport chain. So where aerobic and anaerobic organisms differ is really just in, in they are the same in glycolysis, same Krebs cycle, where they differ is what their final electron acceptor is at the end of the electron transport chain. So anaerobic, um, organisms, they use a different molecule to um, accept those hydrogens at the end. And that just results in less efficient ATP production, so slower growers. Comparing prokaryotes and eukaryotes, again, very same process. Uh, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. So this is a highly, highly conserved process throughout evolution in all organisms. This is a major way that energy is made. So the diff, some of the differences though between prokaryotic metabolism and eukaryotic metabolism um, is where these things occur. So in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, sugar gets taken up into the cell through transporters and then it's used to, as soon as it enters the cytoplasm, we, cells can start doing glycolysis on it. Um, the Krebs cycle is located in different places. So in bacteria, the Krebs cycle still takes place in the cytoplasm. There's really no other place in the cell but the cytoplasm and the membrane. In eukaryotes though, they have an organelle that is really 
um, uh, what's the word? Its function is specialized. It's a specialized organelle for these metabolic processes. And remember, mitochondria were once upon a time, a long time ago, they were just a bacteria. So um, the Krebs cycle takes place inside the mitochondria. The the internal sort of the cytoplasm of the mitochondria is called the matrix. And so it makes sense that the Krebs cycle takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria because it's sort of like the cytoplasm of this ancient internalized bacteria. And the electron transport chain in bacteria takes place in the cell membrane, the plasma membrane of the cell, but in eukaryotes it takes place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria because again that inner membrane of the mitochondria was once upon a time the cellular membrane of a bacteria so fermentation is what a lot of students when they come to this class are trained to think of as anaerobic respiration which is not wrong it is a type of respiration that occurs with it, without the presence of oxygen the difference between fermentation and anaerobic respiration in microbes is that fermentation is the type of anaerobic respiration that takes place in aerobic organisms. So this is sort of a plan B pathway for organisms that normally use oxygen in cellular respiration. And this is sort of a backup plan for them to still be able to make energy if they aren't getting enough oxygen. Well, coffee's cold now. So what happens in fermentation is you undergo glycolysis. So a cell takes glucose and converts it into two molecules of pyruvate or pyruvic acid, same difference. And instead of sending that, converting the pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA and sending it to the uh, Krebs cycle, instead um, the pyruvic acid ends up going through a different pathway through fermentation and depending on the enzymes that the cell has, the pyruvic acid can either be converted to alcohol, ethanol, um, which is how we make beer and wine and liquor, or it can be converted to lactic acid, which is how we make yogurt. Um, and our cells, human cells, when they, the muscle cells do undergo fermentation when they're starving for oxygen, they produce lactic acid. We don't have the enzymes to produce alcohol. Only some um, microbes are, have that ability. So fermentation is not very efficient. It doesn't make a lot of ATP per glucose. And so you need a lot of glucose. Basically a cell that's undergoing fermentation is going to just, just um, burn through calories, essentially just burn lots of glucose molecules to try to make energy. So if you've ever made beer or wine, um, it does require a lot of sugar. It requires a lot of breakdown. So in the case of, of beer of like grain and grain alcohols, you're taking starches, breaking them down into glucose. Um, the microbes are doing that and then they're metabolizing the glucose. And in um, making wine, same thing. The starches and the sugars in the fruit are being converted into alcohol. So you can only make alcohol from sugary or carbohydrate rich things. Um, sorry, everyone's waking up now. You can hear coffee maker in the background. All right, so um, when we are, in order to be able to do these different forms of cellular respiration, we ultimately need glucose, right? We can also use lipids and proteins to make energy, to make ATP for cells. And there's other pathways that we do that. So um, glycolysis uses glucose from polysaccharides like starches. We There's another type of metabolism called beta oxidation, which I like to consider, it's like the glycolysis of fats because it's how we break down fats into acetyl-CoA that then goes through the Krebs cycle and goes through the electron transport chain. So um, it in that pathway, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain for fats, it's beta oxidation, um, a Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. So that it goes through basically the same um, pathways. 
Lipids are broken down by enzymes called lipases, and these lipases then can uh, undergo, or there are enzymes involved in beta oxidation. Proteins can be broken down by proteases, enzymes that cut proteins, and then they have to be deaminated, so the um, nitrogen groups have to be removed, and then it can go into the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Um, but proteins have so many other functions in cells, we really don't use them for energy unless we have an excess or unless our cells are really starving. So we tend to use proteins for other, other functions. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we can, we can metabolize them or that we can feed them into that Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So I'll show you that in this slide here. So if we have, uh, where am I? Okay, so carbohydrates are right here. All right, carbohydrates come from cellulose, um, or when we eat plants, they come from, from starch. Um, we actually don't have the ability to break down cellulose in our bodies. Some bacteria do though, and animals that have those bacteria, like cows and sheep can eat and break down cellulose. Um, so we break down our carbohydrates into these monomers of glucose, which can then go undergo glycolysis to be broken down into pyruvic acid. We convert the pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA, which can then get fed into the Krebs cycle in order to make electron carriers, which are not pictured here, that then go on to the electron transport chain. All right, we can do these, these uh, we can convert proteins into either pyruvic acid or we can convert them into intermediates that feed right into the Krebs cycle, okay? And fatty acids from fats, we can do beta oxidation and convert them into acetyl-CoA that can be fed into the Krebs cycle. So these other macronutrients can be fed into the Krebs cycle in order to pump out carbon dioxide, and a bunch of electron carriers that go to the electron transport chain. So we can use all of those molecules for energy, all right? We also can do these pathways in reverse. We can take, so if you have, if you consume too much glucose as a, you know, human, um, and you make, you break it down, you make all this acetyl-CoA, and then your cell says, eh, we, we don't need any more energy, thanks, that acetyl-CoA can be, can be converted through, you know, like reverse beta oxidation, I don't know what it's called, into um, fatty acids and stored in the muscle, not in the muscle, in um, like the adipose tissue or the liver as fat. And so then when we need energy later, we can break down the fats and back into acetyl-CoA, put it through the Krebs cycle. So um, a lot of these pathways go in both directions. And a lot of the exergonic pathways, the ones that release energy, end up um, fueling the ones that require energy. So there's a lot of these common intermediates, as we would say, like acetyl-CoA and pyruvic acid are common intermediates. They're intermediates of glucose metabolism, but also protein metabolism and fat metabolism, so that it's much more efficient. The cell is very efficient that we use the same pathway for all of these different uh, macromolecules. So that's catabolism. I'm not gonna get into the chemistry of beta oxidation or protein breakdown. Right? I do want you to know in detail though how glucose is utilized by cells. All right? So then we've broken down all these biomolecules into their essential building blocks, amino acids, monosaccharides, triglycerides, right? and now we're gonna use those to build things, build cellular structures that our cells need um, through anabolic pathways. So, um, I like to kind of, I like this little cartoony drawing that when we eat molecules, when we consume food particles, they contain proteins and carbohydrates and fats that are different than the proteins and carbs in our cells, but they're made of the same building blocks. 
So they ultimately look different. We can't use enzymes from plants in our cells, but we can break them down um, and use those building blocks to build our own proteins that we need in our body. And that's, so that's what nutrients are for. They're basically um, like their fuel. So the most important fuel that our cells use is carbohydrates, glucose being the monomer, the most important of the monosaccharides. Starches are basically just long chains of glucose linked together. So starch is in plants, glycogen is in animals, and they're virtually the same molecule, just glycogen has more branches because animal tip cells typically need more energy. We actually move around. Um, other things that we can link glucose molecules together to make are cell walls. All right, cellulose is actually a form of, of glucose just linked together in these straight chains and then packed really tightly together. Peptidoglycan and chitin are modified carbohydrates, so they're carbohydrates plus. And then also we use carbohydrates in the glycocalyx, that sticky, sugary coating outside of cells. So those are some of the, the types of polymers that our cells will build during anabolism. All right, in anabolism of proteins, we take amino acids and link them together to make polypeptides. All right, proteins are really important. They make up cytoskeleton. They make up, they have, uh, proteins are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, the membrane. Um, they make up ribosomes. They, all the enzymes inside of a cell are made of protein. So they're really essential components of the cell. Um, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids. So you have like an alphabet of 20 different letters. And um, we'll talk more about protein synthesis in the next chapter. Um, nucleic acids are also an important biomolecule, so they're not ones that we use for energy. So there's no, we don't um, talk about, we won't get into the catabolism of nucleic acids. So there is catabolism of nucleic They do need to be broken down sometimes, chewed up and recycled, especially RNA. Um, but it's the anabolism, the building of DNA and RNA that is really important because these are coding molecules. They code for proteins. And this is a single nucleotide, a building block of DNA and RNA. So it cont they contain a nitrogenous base, either A, T, G, C, or U, a sugar, a five carbon sugar, which is ribose or deoxyribose, and a phosphate group, okay? very similar to the ATP molecule, which has an A, a ribose, and then three phosphate groups. So ATP and DNA, or really ATP and RNA, are not that far apart. So again, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, it tends to be double-stranded and twisted in a double helix, whereas RNA tends to be single-stranded um, but we'll get, and the difference between, one, another difference between them is the difference in that base, that you, the fourth base they use. DNA uses thymine and RNA uses uracil. So we'll get into, again, we'll continue this in the next chapter, chapter eight. So the thing to understand about cells is they are never static. They're never really done. Um, do, metabolism is always ongoing. So we're always breaking down molecules to make energy in order to build new molecules. Um, and so cells are constantly under construction, just like um, you are, just like your house might be, all right? So a cell goes through a lot of work in its early stages of forming. There's a lot of anabolism going on during that time, and therefore a lot of catabolism to make energy for that anabolism, all right? But even a cell that doesn't seem to be doing much is still, it still has to maintain all of its parts, right? It's still constantly undergoing maintenance. So like if your house is not being built, if you, your house is already built, it's already a good solid structure, 
you still may be doing projects around the house. You're still um, needing to take out waste and you're still maybe, you know, adding furniture or painting the walls, even if there's no like major construction going on. So you can think of cells as kind of always being under construction. They're under major construction if um, they are undergoing cell division and dividing and having to double everything inside them. But even when they are not, there's still a lot of production going on. So catabolism and anabolism are, are constant. And that's the end of chapter seven. It's um, the, the chemistry, the biochemistry is heavy, but hopefully um, I helped clarify it and we'll continue reviewing it until you have it down.